key message concerning the transthoracic echocardiography in ICU. Um, so just some basic, basic or principle, technical principles of the ultrasound, just to remind you what we are using. The first is to have, you have to keep in mind that uh, the ultrasound that we use uh, uh, to do uh, echo is based on the transmission, reflection, and uh, receiving the uh, reflected uh, uh, beam, ultrasound beam. This is the echo, and this is the Doppler, which is based on the Doppler principle for which it's possible to assess the velocity of any flow by assessing the variation, the changes of the frequency of the ultrasound beam. Just to show you that there is different um, uh, modes using echo, the first one is what we call the M mode. We use only one line through the heart, for example, here through the left ventricle. And so the, this beam is hitting the septum and after that the posterior wall. We are really perpendicular to the posterior wall. And we may have this imaging with the size of the left ventricle during diastole and during systole which is possible to assess, okay? Because it is uh, what we call a M mod. It's a time motion. So it means that you have an echo here, and after that, you have a movement during the time. The second technique is uh, 2D imaging. The 2D imaging, you have many different lines, and you can see the heart. This Second technique is a Doppler technique. And to the Doppler technique, we can assess the velocity and the direction of the flow. Why? Because if you look at the equation of Doppler, you see that when you have an emission of ultrasound beam which hit a blood flow, so the ultrasound is reflected to the probe, and the reflected ultrasound beam has a different frequency when you compare the frequency to the emitted beam. And the difference between these two frequencies may be useful to measure, to calculate the velocity of this blood flow. So, the velocity is easy to calculate when you have the two frequency. But we have to keep in mind that you have in the equation the cosinus theta. And the cosinus theta is the angle between the probe and the uh, flow. If you are in the same alignment, it means that you have no angle. The angle is 0 or 180. So cosinus of 0 is one. So you get the maximal velocity of the flow. In contrast, if you are perpendicular to the flow, 90 degrees, cosinus of 90, I don't know if you do remind that, so it's zero. <laughs> so it's impossible to have any flow. It's impossible to record any flow if you are perpendicular to the flow. Okay? So you should be in the same axis. Okay? So, if you follow me, if I put a probe here at the apical part of the heart, so I will be in the same axis that all flows left atrium, left ventricle. Flow, the filling of the left ventricle in this direction. So, I am in the same axis as my ultrasound beam. Okay, agree? After that, the ejection, left ventricle, aorta. This direction, same direction, you can assess it. Now, mitral regurgitation, left ventricle, left atrium, from the apex, I am in the right position. Aortic regurgitation, aorta, left ventricle, in the same direction. So if I want to assess 
flows using Doppler, you should assess this flow from the apex. Okay? If I want to analyze the heart, I should be in parasternal position because I am perpendicular to the walls. But from a parasternal, it's not possible to assess the flows because I am perpendicular to the flows. Cosinus theta, 90 degrees, zero. Okay, so you have always to keep in mind that you should pay attention of the angle between your flow and your ultrasound beam. Because if you have, for example, 20 degrees, so you will decrease, you, you will have an underestimation under of the flow. Okay? More the angle increase, less the velocity will be recorded. Here you are one meter, here you have an angle of 40 degrees, you have only uh, 60, 60 centimeters per second. That's very important. Okay, so just uh, to show you that it's possible to assess the velocity. It is one information. The second information, be because you have F0 minus F1, if the flow is moving far away from the probe, so you will have a negative, a negative result. So if you have a negative result, it means that your flow is moving far away from your probe, and then you will have a negative flow. In contrast, for example, here, if you analyze from the apical part of the, le of the heart, if you would like to assess the aortic flow, the ejection flow from the left ventricle into the aorta, the flow is in this direction, your probe is here, so it's going far away from the probe. So you will have a negative flow. Okay? If you have a flow which is moving toward your probe, you will have a positive flow. Here, for example, is it, it is the filling of the left ventricle. The filling of the left ventricle is from the left atrium into the left ventricle. This direction. Okay? So two information, the velocity, the maximal velocity, and the direction of the flow. And that's exactly what you have here on the spectral Doppler. You have the velocities. Here you have the range of your velocities, the scale with different velocity. For example, here, your aortic blood flow is one meters per second. And you see that the direction is far away of the, is, go, is moving far away from the probe because you have a negative flow. Good, understand? I'm oh, sleeping. You need some perfusion of uh, caffeine, I think. <laughs> So when you use a pulsed Doppler and the continuous wave Doppler, it's not only to have a velocity. Because what, what can we do with velocities of flow? We are intensivists. OK, one meter, two meters, three meters, what does it mean? Don't care. But now, if I tell you, if I tell you that the velocity of the flow between this first cavity and this second cavity depends only, only, only on the pressure gradient between the first cavity and the second cavity. So you may calculate the pressure gradient by assessing the velocity of the flow. If you have a velocity, for example, here at two meters per second, so 2 multiplied by 2 multiplied by 4. It, so? <laughs> 4 multiplied by 4. What, what did you say? <laughs> ah, 16. Thank you. Some people are not sleeping. <laughs> they may calculate as well. <laughs> it's too hard <laughs> after, the, after the, the lunch. So that's very important to, uh, to, to have this, 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 this um, uh, um, concept in your mind. 
when you have any velocity, convert the velocity into a pressure gradient between the two gravity, uh, uh, between which the flow is moving. Okay? Oh. So, okay. I will, sh I will check if you are sleeping or not. Okay. This is a flow. The velocity, the f this flow is a tricuspid regurgitation. So, if you assess it from the apex, right ventricle, right atrium, the flow is moving far away from the probe. So, it is negative flow. Okay? And I tell you that the velocity of this flow is 3 meters per second. What does it mean? So, just do a conversion into a pressure gradient. Okay? The it means that you have 36 millimeters of mercury. So do you agree with me that if you have here the right atrial pressure and here the pressure into the left ventricle, you agree with me that this velocity represents 36 millimeters of mercury, which is a pressure gradient between the right atrium and the right ventricle during systole. Okay? If you are working in the ICU, you have the right atrial pressure, the CVP. So let's add the CVP here, 2 millimeters of mercury with a pressure gradient. And then, what can you assess is the si pressure, systolic pressure, into the right ventricle. And because you have no pressure gradient between the right ventricle and the pulmonary artery, so you assess the systolic pressure into the pulmonary artery just by measuring the maximal velocity of your tricuspid regurgitation. And we all have a small tricuspid regurgitation. It's like physiological. Okay? Just to be sure that you will under, well understand that, my resident, this crazy resident that we have, you know, <laughs> incredible. So let's say, so he, he recorded this velocity of two meters per second for a mitral regurgitation. Is it possible? Is there any problem? Convert the two meters per second into pressure gradient. So it's 16 millimeters of mercury, okay? Everybody agrees? Let's see a clinical situation. Oh, sorry, so I didn't. Let's see a clinical situation which is really terrible. This is a patient with a cardiogenic shock, almost dying, <coughs> having 7.5, uh, 76 millimeters of mercury for the systolic pressure, okay? and have a, having a, a wedge pressure, or PAOP, of 40 millimeters of mercury, pressure into the, the left atrium. So it means, do you agree with me, that the maximal velocity of the mitral regurgitation reflect the pressure gradient between the left atrium and the left ventricle during systole? This is exactly this pressure gradient. Agree? From here to here. It is here, 36 millimeters of mercury. If I have really a patient almost dying with a wedge pressure of 240, so I have 36. And my resident recorded this flow. Why? Angle, good. The angle between the probe and the flow. Uh, he underestimated the velocity of the flow. Okay, you agree with that? Let's move to something else now. So the second point is by using the Doppler, it's possible to assess, to estimate the stroke volume. So that will be more complex. You have to follow me. Sorry, I have to move a little bit. <laughs> so let's imagine, I say that to the guy over there because he is recording. <laughs> so you have the aorta here. Okay, 
the, the um, aortic annulus, left ventricle over there, and you have the aorta here. Okay? Imagine that you are during systole. So you have an opening valve, and the flow is moving from the valve, and is going into the aorta until, until what? Until the closure of the aortic valve. Okay? So here I am. Do you agree with me that the blood inside the aorta from here to the aortic annulus is the stroke volume? So the stroke volume is everything inside the aorta. How to calculate this volume? We may have to calculate the volume of a cylinder. You should have the area and the length. Agree? So, how to calculate the area? It's very simple. By using echo, two-dimensional echo, it's possible to measure the aortic annulus. And so, by measuring the diameter, you convert in an area. Okay? Now, how to calculate the length? Very simple. For example, consider that the flow is moving at the same velocity, always. And let's imagine that the valve is open during one second, and let's imagine that the velocity is one meter per second. So during one second, which is a distance? One meter. Okay. So if I have the mean velocity of my flow and the, dura the duration of the systole, I may calculate the length. That's exactly what we have when we record the, the aortic blood flow because we have the maximal velocity, but as well, if you do the area, you will have the mean velocity, and you have the duration time during which the valve is open. So if you do the mean velocity divided by the time, okay, uh, multiplied by the time, so meters per second multiplied by seconds in time, the time, you have the length. And so by measuring only two things, the diameter of the aortic annulus and recording the aortic blood flow is possible to calculate the stroke volume and the cardiac output. Very simplistic way to assess that. Agree? I will move to some. So this is the pulsed and the continuous wave Doppler. Now we have what we call the color Doppler. You, I explained to you that with the uh, Doppler is possible to assess the velocity and the direction of any flow. Agree? If I analyze these two, L, two uh, the, the, the two, the direction, both two, the direction and the velocity at this point, at this point, at this point, and if I consider that if the flow is moving far away of the probe, I will put a blue, and if the flow is moving towards the probe, I will put a red, and if I told you that more is bright, higher is the velocity, so it's possible to have a color Doppler. Here, I know, can you put again the, 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 the movie, please? That would be nice. Thank you. So here, you have the left atrium, the left ventricle, the aorta. So you, you will have a flow which is moving from the left atrium into the left ventricle, so it will be in, r in red because it's moving towards the probe. Okay? High velocity inside and low velocity outside. And here we have the ejection of the left ventricle, blue. It means that the flow is moving far away from the probe. So by using the color Doppler, you can assess the direction of the flow. You can assess if there is any normal or abnormal flow inside the heart, okay? The last technique is what we call the tissue Doppler imaging. The tissue Doppler imaging is very simple. It's a pulse Doppler only. 
And we analyze not the velocity of flow, but we analyze the velocity of the movement of the mitral annulus. And the movement of the mitral annulus is related to the myocardial function. The velocity of the movement of your mitral annulus during systole okay, is a very good parameter to assess the systolic function of the left ventricle. The velocity of the mitral annulus during diastole is a very good parameter to assess the relaxation, the diastolic function of the left ventricle. So just you put your sample volume at the level of the mitral annulus and you assess the velocity of the mu movement during systole. If the velocity is, is high, it means that the contractility is very good. And if during diastole the velocity is high, it means that the relaxation is fast and good. So it's very simple way to assess the myocardial function of the left ventricle, okay? Just to show you how to do a transthoracic echo in ICU, very simplistic way, just to show you that there is a parasternal, some windows, parasternal, subcostal, apical view. The first parasternal, you put the probe just in parasternal position and you will cut the long axis of the heart, the long axis of the heart, par posterior wall, septal wall, left atrium, left ventricle. This is a typical imaging of parasternal long axis view. After that, if you rotate the prop clockwise, you will have a short axis view of the wall. And if you tilt down or you tilt up Without moving the probe in the same position over the chest, you will cut, cut the left ventricle at the apex, at the mid part of the level of the mitral valve or at the level of aortic valve. And then you will have different view, aortic view, mitral view, and left ventricular view, which is very interesting to assess the contractility of the left ventricle. Here, you can assess the contractility of the left ventricle. After that, you have an apical view. You put the probe at the apex. So you will see the four chambers. Four chambers view. Left ventricle, right ventricle, left atrium, right atrium. Very nice view. Subcostal is for the IVC. And it's possible to put your M mod and to measure the IVC. So how to use a TTE? For example, just an example, a patient who is shocked in French, yeah, thank you. So the first the thing that you have to do is to rule out any pericardial effusion. The second step, do I have to give a fluid? To do that, you have different way to do, to assess the IVC, to assess, sorry, to assess the IVC, and if you have a very small IVC like this, it means that maybe you can give a fluid, you will in increase and improve the clinical situation. Third, evaluation of the left ventricle, ejection fraction, and then by the ejection fraction, which is possible to do it only by looking at the screen, you, do, you don't have to do any measurement. Just you look at the screen. Is my function is normal, hyperkinetic, hypokinetic or akinetic, okay? That's it. I don't need more. I am simplistic in my head because I am intensivist, you know? So I just would like to know if I have to give dobutamine or not. <laughs> so if I have a decreased ejection fraction and then my patient is in shock and I have a high blood lactate level, I will start the dobutamine. In contrast, even if I have a high level of blood lactate, and level, and if I have hyperkinesia or normokinesia, I will not give dobutamine. So you don't have to do a, a precise measurement of the ejection factor. We don't care. Only looking at the screen, eyeballing evaluation. You see that it's possible. The, the, the fourth 
to assess the right ventricle, and it is very simplistic. Very simplistic. You check the size of the right ventricle for, from a four chamber view. If the size is smaller than the left ventricle, it's normal. If, if the right ventricle has the same size, or if the right ventricle is higher than the left ventricle, it means that you have a problem with the right ventricle. Okay, very simplistic way. For example, here, you see that you have a big right ventricle, a very small left ventricle. Something is going wrong. Okay? So, in conclusion, transthoracic is mandated in patients with shock or respiratory failure in ICU patients. Okay? That should be repeated, not only one shot. You give a fluid, you come back to check if the patient is still fluid responder or not if the patient has a systolic dysfunction or something new. So you have to check. So you have to do the first check. You have to repeat the examination. And I really think that together with the arterial blood pressure, it's announced to manage all patients with shock and respiratory failure. That's it. I'm ready for any questions from you.